Today, the U.S. State Department confirmed that a U.S. Marine veteran was killed on the outskirts of Bakhmut, Ukraine. 26-year-old Cooper Harris Andrews was likely killed by a mortar on April 19th while helping citizens ev evacuate the embattled city, according to his mother. She says his body still has not been recovered because of the fierce ongoing fighting there. CNN's Nick Payton Walsh reports for us now from southeastern Ukraine as the world awaits a major new phase in the war and in the battle in Bakhmut. It was hard to get much uglier, but each dawn, still the battle for Bakhmut grinds on. Ukraine Monday said it had pushed Russian forces back who had abandoned positions. Months of agonizing fighting for about a football field every day, say analysts. Leaving little standing. And Russian injured, the soldiers here said abandoned. There was a guy laying there in the reeds, he says, yelling, guys, come and help me for three days, only a hundred yards from the Russians. Also emerging, too, on this, the road of life, the last way in and out of the city, news of the death of Cooper Harris Andrews, age 26, a former U.S. Marine and firefighter from Cleveland, Ohio, who felt compelled to join Ukraine's fight. Cooper wanted to correct things. We had a lot of conversations about fashion. I said, Cooper, so that means you're just going over there to drive an ambulance. <laughs> No, you just don't believe in stuff. You like do something about it. Harris, let's make a picture for history. Here he is near the front line in January as part of the Foreign Legion. Described as ideological to the core and anti-authoritarian, his body has yet to be recovered from Bakhmut as the fighting is too intense. His mother recalled the last time they spoke. I asked Cooper, because I'm like Cooper's mom, like, is there anything I can try and get to you or send you? And Cooper said, yes. Can you send me hot sauce and chopsticks? <laughs> so I have like a thousand chopsticks in my house because I was trying to get chopsticks for everyone. I figured Cooper was chopsticks. And I have all these little packets of um, hot sauce that I was going to send the Cooper. Over the past weeks, graphic battle footage has emerged, showing what it's like when Russians get into a Ukrainian trench network. Here, a soldier races into cover. But soon, a shell hits. They are all miraculously OK, but the attack has started. Watch, and you see a Russian approach and throw a grenade. He misses. And they go on to shoot down Russians advancing meters from them. Shells continue to land. The attack persists for over 10 minutes. But the brutal fight for Bakhmut goes on and on. So what is happening around Bakhmut? A matter of weeks ago, the Russians seemed to be signaling that they were in the ascendant, and then we had the Russian head of the Wagner mercenary group, Evgeny Prigozhin, over the weekend suggest they're running out of artillery shells and might have to pull back, and now Ukraine says they're on the front foot and Russians are abandoning their positions. The city's becoming a kind of signalling game for both sides to project strength and then possibly drag each other's forces in. It is something of a sideshow despite the extraordinary loss of life. One indication from John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson, is they might Russia have lost 100,000 uh, troops since December, mostly fighting for Bakhmut. That's casualties, dead and wounded. The real eyes, though, right now on the larger counteroffensive, most likely not around Bakhmut, but in the south of Ukraine, Jake. All right, Nick Payton Walsh, uh, live for us in Zaporizhia, Ukraine. Thank you. Stay safe. Joining us now to take a, a step back uh, on the war in Ukraine, take a 30,000-foot uh, view, uh, The Atlantic magazine's editor-in-chief, Jeffrey Goldberg, he and staff writer Ann Applebaum wrote the June edition's cover story entitled The Case for the Total Liberation of Ukraine. And you can read that online uh, today. Jeffrey, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. You write that a victory for Ukraine can be easily... Defined, it would mean sovereignty, safety, justice, but, but getting there, not so easy. 
to define. You spoke with Zelensky mm -hmm. uh, at length twice. Um, where does his optimism uh, about a victory, about a path to this, this, this proposal, um, where does it come from? His optimism comes in part from the serial uh, underestimation of the entire world about Ukraine's capabilities. Sure. I, I mean, you know, you, we, we talk about Bakhmut, uh, Russia bogged down in this tiny town, relatively small town, uh, for months and months and, and months. Um, if you recall, think back 14, 15 months ago, we thought Ukraine was going to be wiped out, wiped off the map in a matter of days. Uh, and, you know, we were in Kyiv, uh, I was in Kyiv last year, I was here there this year. Um, the change is remarkable, even though it's under periodic rocket attack. Uh, you know, there is no existential threat to most of the country anymore. And what, what I mean by all of that is that we have underestimated their resolve, their capabilities, um, their desire to win. Russia has no morale whatsoever. The Ukrainians are all morale. Our argument, of course, is that Ukraine, the, 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 the fighters of Ukraine can do this without foreign troops, without U.S. troops, NATO troops. But what they can't do without is the support, uh, is, is the, the American material, the weapon systems, the most advanced weapon systems. This is the year to do it. Um, obviously, the U.S. has provided a tremendous amount of material to the Ukrainians. Yeah, more than anyone by far. By, by far, by far. But, but the argument now is if they have just a little bit more help, and a little yeah. bit more concentration of help, they'll actually be able to change the lines on the battlefield. You also write about the looming counteroffensive. Yeah. You write, quote, Ukrainians are waiting for the counteroffensive. Uh, Europeans, east and west, are waiting for the counteroffensive. Central Asians are waiting for the counteroffensive. Belarusians, Venezuelans, Iranians, and others around the world whose dictatorships are propped up by the Russians, they are all waiting for the counteroffensive, too. This spring, this summer, this autumn, Ukraine gets a chance to alter geopolitics for a generation, and so does the United States. States. Do you think President Biden agrees with that? Uh, I think President Biden feels that very much. I think he has a pretty acute understanding of the centrality of the U.S. role here. The U.S. is the leader, to use a somewhat archaic term, but no longer archaic, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. is the leader of the free world. Right? Ukraine, Ukraine can keep itself from losing, however we define losing, right? That's what they proved to us in those opening days of the war when they didn't get steamrolled, right? Ukraine cannot win without the United States behind it 100%. The danger here, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a range of views inside the Biden administration. I think everyone's heart, certainly the president's heart, is with the people of Ukraine and the president of Ukraine. I think there are differing uh, views about whether the Ukrainians can actually push Russia out of all of its territory, all the territory that it's holding, right, including Crimea. Crimea, the hardest one, obviously, and right. there's obviously an interesting debate over whether they can uh, achieve that. The main fear, of course, is that the U.S. is trying, and Biden has done a very good job of doing this, calibrating to, to, to calibrating this so that they don't provoke Russia into doing something insane. And the worry, of course, is that the Russians will use a nuclear weapon in some form or fashion. Yeah, President Biden, when I interviewed him last fall, seemed to suggest that Putin was halfway there uh, in terms of the the stability, uh, but right. I want to, you met, you, the interesting part of your story, you met with Ukrainians who are working in these privately financed yeah. drone workshops, and you saw how drones that were used uh, for wedding photography before the war were, were, had been transformed into lethal weapons that could even destroy a, a, a tank. Is the ingenuity of the Ukrainian people one of its uh, most secret weapons? This is, this is, this is why they don't need troops from the United States. They, they don't need that much advice from the United States. They need, they need material help. The, these, these drone factories are, are amazing. The defense minister of Ukraine told us something that was fascinating. He said, when the war started, people thought that this was going to be a war between a large Soviet army and a small Soviet army. But what they didn't understand was that Ukraine had changed over the last yeah. 20 or 30 years and was now a Western army, an innovative or flattened hierarchy. The Russians are still fighting like Soviets. The Ukrainians are fighting like American special forces. Um, the drone workshops are just a case in point. The Russians in Bakhmut and elsewhere are just trying to go home alive, right? They don't care. They, they, the morale is extremely low. The Ukrainians are fighting for their cities. They're building, I mean, they're using, they're using literally wedding drones. They're using model airplanes so as drones. And they're doing this in hundreds of different locations on their own initiative. It's totally fascinating to watch. The story is uh, The Case for the Total Liberation of Ukraine, written by uh, Jeffrey and uh, Ann Applebaum. 
on theatlantic.com right now. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Amazing reporting.